uh, then more people will get on more people will get on on board but i think we should get started because i really look forward to um to professor Sairaj dockles presentation he is at uh, university of minnesota i've known him for a long time and i'm really curious myself to learn um, the small anecdote here about distributed slack bus and slack bus in general when i was like the youngest people on this call um, age, um, I just got out of grad school and I started working on Slack bus and can we get rid of it? And uh, uh, my first paper got rejected. Sairaj, I must have told you this, this story. And um, I, was, I really was determined to answer this question that Sairaj is uh, also attempting here. And uh, somebody said, do it after you get tenured. And I never returned to it. So I look forward to Sairaj, maybe you want to say a few more words about yourself, what you do, or you just want to get going with the talk. We very much appreciate it. Depending on how much time Sairaj uses, uses, we can also leave at least 10 minutes or something to have. Uh, if there are clarification questions, you can put them in the chat, uh, in the Q&A and chat meanwhile. But um, just in the chat, I guess you can do it here. And then, um, at the end, we will have an interactive discussion. So thank you very much, Sairaj. We very much appreciate your time. Absolutely, Maria. We can jump right in. I just want to make sure uh, that what's being recorded and what you can see is the actual presentation and not the speaker notes. Is that correct? Yeah, is that, yeah it is good. Uh, it's slideshow, yeah. OK, OK, sounds good. All right, so uh, we'll just jump uh, right in here. Uh, thanks, Maria and Dan, for setting up the seminar series. The lineup of talks is quite excellent, and that's not just a subtle pat on my back. Uh, and more seriously, I think the themes are on point, right, with regard to what we as a community need to address to realize the grid of the future. Uh, and today, what I'm going to talk about is a construct uh, that is one of the most familiar ones to power engineers across the board, the Slack bus. Uh, but we'll see it's not so familiar as well. Uh, actually, we will talk about the so-called uh, distributed Slack bus, as Maria was mentioning, and we will trace its roots to the very core of uh, grid operations uh, and control. So to appreciate the Slack bus, it is first important to appreciate, uh, sorry, to appreciate the distributed Slack bus, uh, it is first important to appreciate the Slack bus. Uh, and the only way to appreciate the Slack bus is by clearly delineating what it's not. Uh, so to contrary, uh, contrary to what you may have heard in Power Systems 101, the Slack bus is not the largest generator in your study, right? However, you might want to quantify and qualify largest. It is not a representation of the remainder of the grid that you did not model in your power flow, uh, nor is it the angle reference. Uh, on the topic of the angle reference, uh, while we will soon find out that we don't need a singular Slack bus, we actually always need an angle reference to resolve uh, rotational symmetry in the power flow solution. Uh, so having gone over at least some elements of what the Slack bus is not, uh, we can again dwell a little bit on what it might be. Uh, and paying homage to Maria's origin story, I want to quote Zaborski from one of his papers, where he indicated that the Slack bus is but a computational artifice. Uh, we will see that this is definitely true if ever referenced in the context of contemporary power flow problems, but it was actually not the case from back in the day. It really did mean something tangible. Uh, and, and we'll have more on that to come. So this presentation will not get into technical derivations. I will vocally convey sketches to proofs for key results at a quite high level. Uh, for technical details, I invite you to check out uh, the two transactions on power systems papers that are flashed on the screen. Uh, on, uh, and, and Maria, you'll, you'll see some familiar names uh, on at least the second paper there. All right. So to get to the distributed Slack bus, we have to appreciate the architecture and operation of the grid from both spatial and temporal perspectives. Uh, here's a cartoon that conveys physical layer dynamics, pertinent control actions, uh, and system optimization routines for the timescales of interest. Uh, on the physical layer, we have to keep in mind synchronous generator dynamics at the AC cycle timescales. Uh, it's quite sufficient to model generator dynamics with the sync equations uh, augmented with a turbine governor for this purpose. On the slowest time scales, we have dispatch schedules labeled P star coming from an economic dispatch or OPF type problem solved every five to 10 minutes or so. This is typically done in a look ahead fashion with no knowledge of the real time load, just a forecast. Uh, 
So to resolve that aspect and correct for transients and frequency and tie line flows, we have an automatic generation control system that is temporally sandwiched in the two to four second time frame in the middle. Uh, this distributed feedback control system modulates the dispatch schedules and uh, relays reference commands to generators uh, to account for those uh, real time fluctuations. Um, and next, we'll take a slightly deeper dive by examining the architecture from a spatial context. Uh, the layer in blue at the very bottom of this cartoon is the collection of generators and loads connected via transmission lines and transformers across balancing areas. Two are shown in this particular illustration. The layer in green at the very top is the dispatch routine. A very simple economic dispatch problem with supply demand balance constraints is illustrated here. Uh, of course, more complex routines are indeed deployed in practice, but to appreciate the distributed Slack bus, what we really need to pay attention to are the optimizers. These are the P star quantities uh, that are shown uh, in the green box, and they are obtained as a solution of your dispatch routine of choice. The secondary control layer is the one shown in orange, and that's sitting in the middle. Uh, this is commonly referred to as automatic generation control, or AGC for short. Uh, and the implementation here is the so-called, um, and I want to get this terminology right, net interchange tie line balance control. Uh, the idea behind this layer is to drive the ACE, the area control error to zero. Uh, you can see this is illustrated as accomplished via a PI, con a, via PI controller in this figure, uh, but actual implementations are presumably more complex and uh, not necessarily relevant in the context of this talk. The area control error is actually a catch-all term. Uh, it's a catch-all error, and this encodes information on the area level net additional power required over or above uh, or below that conveyed by dispatch to drive tie line flows as well as scheduled values uh, uh, to, to, to their scheduled values and frequency to synchronous steady state. So there's two parts that, that make up the area control error, tie line flows between control areas as well as frequency. So ultimately this area level net additional power that's required in order to drive the area control error to zero. So that term is actually disaggregated and then conveyed to individual generators in the form of their reference uh, commands, denoted P ref. And that specific decomposition is governed by so-called AGC participation factors. Uh, in this figure, they are denoted by the terms alphas one, two, three, and four. So the textbook power flow problem that we introduce to every undergraduate student uh, it aspires to solve for voltage magnitudes and phase angles in such electrical networks, uh, but it, do, it does so while not comprehensively acknowledging the effect of the complex hierarchy of control and optimization routines that are actually working behind the scenes. Uh, we write the power balance equations at all buses. Uh, they take this very familiar form. We can all write this uh, in our sleep. Uh, and injections at all but one generator buses are laid out in the problem statement as, as given quantities. Uh, one quickly realizes that there is no way to solve all these nonlinear algebraic equations without leaving one of the power injections unspecified. Uh, there are many ways to see why this is. One is to recognize that you cannot know what the losses are beforehand. So there is this special generator. It receives very specific designation of this slack bus. And this Slack bus has to make up for them. Uh, indeed, with this context in mind, we can perhaps appreciate uh, Zaborski's comment from before that the Slack bus is a computational artifice, uh, since the real grid clearly doesn't operate in this uh, specific manner. So what we really need then is a formulation of this type for the power balance equations. Uh, the active power injections at all generator buses are expressed as a nominal injection plus a correction factor that is composed of the product of a participation factor, the pi term, uh, and a slack variable, the psi term. This is the so-called distributed slack bus. Uh, no single generator is picked out to be special. Uh, and the aspiration with this formulation is to align it to be as close to practice uh, as possible. Uh, so while this formulation appears periodically in the literature, uh, definitely not mentioned in any major textbook, mind you, it's constitutive elements, right? So the P circle, the pi, the psi terms, these have never been precisely hammered down. And we will do exactly that in the slides to come. 
I want to point out that solving the power flow in this manner requires a little additional information, uh, but it does not impose much additional computational burden. In fact, a lot of simulation packages have the capability to solve power flow problems with a distributed Slack bus. Uh, but if you dig up the supporting documentation, it's vague at best on what these constitutive elements should be and what their values uh, and how their values can be sourced. So let's take a little journey through time. Uh, this is really the only way to truly understand why we have the concepts of the Slack bus and the distributed Slack bus. Uh, it'll also allow us to appreciate the relevant prior art in a chronological manner. Uh, and in this topic area, this ends up being quite interesting and, and illuminating. Uh, we'll need to pay attention to the era between the 40s and the early 70s. Here's a map of the US with high voltage transmission lines superimposed. Uh, as you can see, right around the 40s, there is an exponential increase in the number of lines and the geographic expanse that they spanned. Uh, we will see that there was a very specific reason to this, and it's all in interest in the context of the Slack bus uh, and the distributed Slack bus. Central to the story around interconnections and their explosive growth uh, is the gentleman pictured here, Nathan Cohn. Uh, Nathan worked for a company called Leeds and Northrop. Uh, back in the day, they made measurement devices for the grid. He was inducted into the NAE in 1969 and was awarded uh, really one of the highest uh, awards that you can get from the IEEE, the IEEE Edison Medal in 82. Uh, Nathan was instrumental in rolling out the net interchange tie-line bias control architecture we examined earlier on. Uh, this idea was actually first tried out uh, for the so-called United Pool in the 40s. This was a collection of uh, power companies in Iowa, Illinois, uh, Kansas, and Missouri. Uh, I must say that we figured out a lot of the history that is presented in this presentation uh, through the work of Julie Cohn. Julie is Nathan Cohn's daughter. Uh, she's a renowned historian of the grid at the University of Houston, and she's done an exceptional job of documenting some of the history of interconnections in a recent book titled The Grid. Uh, in fact, it's actually available through uh, MIT Press. So uh, while today we might balk at the idea of trying anything new at scale for the grid, back then it was a very different story. Uh, Nathan's quotes on the topic of how the architecture was rolled out and perfected by experimentation at times of low demand are equal parts inspiring and horrifying, depending on whether you're a researcher or a grid operator. Here's a particularly interesting one. He points to the limited control theory that existed back then. He says there was not much scope for simulation either. Uh, experimentation on the best of all simulators, power systems themselves was feasible and was practiced. There are other pithy gems such as this one, where he reports that in spite of all the constraints, real or perceived, known or unknown, operations were as expected. So what did this all mean? Uh, basically, before the 40s, there were limited attempts uh, at and examples of interconnected operation across the United States. Um, multiple generators began to regulate frequency across balancing areas after the 40s. Uh, and these early successful experiments uh, at interconnection drove this. Uh, there were obviously, uh, there were several obvious economic and, and reliability benefits to be had in interconnections. And that's why we saw that explosive uh, growth in interconnections across the US. But where does the power flow problem uh, come in? So to the best of our knowledge and uh, to the best of the literature review that we could perform, the first instance of the textbook plain vanilla power flow problem that we introduced to undergrads, you know, the one with one slack bus, a few PQ buses, PV buses, and so on, uh, appears in this 1956 paper by Purdue researchers uh, Ward and Hale. Names you may recognize actually from other contributions in, in power system analysis. Uh, it's quite instructive to dig into the discussion section of papers from that era. Uh, I really wish they brought that concept back today. Uh, perhaps impossible given how we must all publish several hundred papers every year or perish trying, right? But in any case, uh, deep in this discussion section is a comment by one E.E. E. George, uh, who incidentally has quite a prominent role to play in the grand story of electrification, as it were, since he is credited with stitching together loss terms and economic dispatch problems. Uh, but that's slightly diverting from the point. So what did George say? Uh, he offered in my opinion, uh, the clearest articulation of a slack bus or a slack machine, as he called it, that would make sense if ever referenced in power flow problems, but only in that unique point of time in history. Uh, it was a tangible thing at the time and not just a computational artifact. 
So in George's words, he says, the Slack machine is the regulating generator, which controls frequency or tie line loading, which cannot be scheduled in megawatt output until the difference between generation and load plus loss is calculated, measured by telemeters, or balanced by a frequency controller. So the point is clear. Uh, multiple generators were regulating frequency across balancing areas by the 50s. Um, but formulations aligned with control schemes where a single generator was doing most of the frequency regulation. This was a very clear instance of academia and academic formulations lagging practice in what was happening in the field. It was only in the 70s, 1971 to be precise, that none other than Fred Schweppe seems to have the first published effort on a distributed Slack bus. Uh, the idea appeared in a master's thesis that Schweppe supervised, uh, but it wasn't called the distributed Slack bus. Uh, the title makes reference to computing load flow solutions. Again, load flow was a popular term for power mm -hmm. flow back in the day. Uh, without a swing bus, another popular term uh, for the Slack bus from back in the day. Um, and indeed, this was a notable attempt at aligning formulations with practice, right? Instead of the norm up to that time, where formulations only aligned with control schemes where a single generator was providing that frequency regulation. Uh, however, the formulation and the approach that uh, Schweppe laid out in this work uh, did not completely incorporate grid operations in the specification of the distributed slack bus and the solution of the power flow problem. It was rather more focused on uh, algorithmic aspects. If you really dig through the technical details, uh, that, that underlie this master's thesis. That said, the aspiration was very clear. Uh, it's in fact evidenced by this snippet from the future work section of the thesis. Uh, it indicated exactly what needed to be done and why Shweti perhaps initiated the work on the Slack bus. So he pointed out that applications of these new methods are indeed suggested to tie line control and economic dispatch of a power system. So there was finally a formulation of the power flow problem that aligned with practice uh, to some extent. Uh, however, in the literature that followed, the constitutive elements were never quite formalized. Maybe one reason for this is that it requires an in-depth understanding of control, optimization, and physical layer dynamics. Uh, very few have attempted to cross these boundaries and examine research topics uh, at that intersection. And of course, one notable exception is Maria. In a 97 paper, Maria references the distributed Slack bus and makes some passing comments on how it can all be accomplished by paying attention to AGC and dispatch. Uh, a formal treatment, however, was never provided. Uh, and in her defense, it wasn't really the focus of this specific paper. So let's go back to the distributed Slack bus formulation. And let me tell you what we formally established in our work. Uh, so we'll have to remember that there are three constitutive elements uh, that we want to tie to operations. Uh, covering both optimization and control. There are these nominal injections, the P-circle terms, uh, the participation factors, the pi terms, uh, and the slack variable, the, the psi term. And of course, as we can now appreciate, these should all be related to the system architecture, which as you will remember, looks uh, something like this. And it turns out that in this, you know, quite seemingly complex architecture, there indeed are three important ingredients to this distributed Slack bus recipe. And these are the ones that are highlighted uh, in the colored boxes. So what are these? From the tertiary control layer, so this is the one in green, the terms that we will find to be important are the economic dispatch or uh, uh, OPF routine optimizers. Okay, So these are the P star terms. From the secondary control layer or the AGC system, we have the AGC participation factors or the alpha terms. Uh, I want to point uh, your uh, memory back to what these actually were. So these were the feed forward coefficients that dictated the disaggregation of the additional power that's required above or below dispatch to generators in each area. And finally, in the physical layer, we have the net load imbalance in each area. So these are the delta P soup one and delta P soup two terms. Uh, these are terms that are associated with the load that show up in real time, but are not reflected in the projection or forecast of net load that is acknowledged in dispatch. So in other words, in the context of this figure, the actual load is the sum of P load star and delta P, right, across both control areas, but the load forecast in dispatch is just the sum of P load star. It's just a, just a look ahead term uh, that we take for granted. And so here's the correct formulation 
the generator output powers have to be modeled as the sum of the optimizer from economic dispatch and a fraction of the net load imbalance corresponding to the balancing area that the generators belong to. The specific fraction is governed by the AGC participation factor. Intuitively, it all makes sense, and it aligns with passing references made to this concept through the years, such as the one by Maria, for instance. That said, it is not a trivial exercise to show that this is indeed the case. Uh, to show this requires quite a detailed examination of the generator dynamics, covering the swing equations and the governor, uh, the AGC dynamics, the power flow equations in steady state. Details are in the paper that I referenced to in the start of the talk, and we won't dig into those uh, in this conversation. So there are obviously several reasons then why the distributed slack formulation has remained shrouded in confusion. Uh, of course, the complex grid architecture that it aspires to acknowledge is the preliminary reason, and it definitely doesn't help in, in simplifying matters. Uh, but a related question is the lack of understanding or not how to solve the power flow, uh, but rather when and how to interpret the results depending on when we solve it. So to that end, uh, let's consider the following illustration. Okay, this is an illustration of system frequency, uh, say a center of inertia version in a slightly uh, highly coherent uh, power grid in between two instances of dispatch. Okay, so these are the boundaries on, uh, on, on the very left and the very right. Uh, I should mark uh, uh, the fact that the x-axis here is quite comically and incorrectly exaggerated, right, to prove the point. So it's not to scale. And there are periods of synchronous steady state, shaded gray, uh, and these are punctuated by large disturbances, right? They could be. So with a large disturbance, such as the one that's implied in this figure that kicks frequency away from uh, synchronous steady state, we get governor action that kicks in. Uh, this arrests the frequency, and that's before secondary control restores operation back to synchronous steady state. So why do we care about figures such as this to illustrate the point? It so turns out that whenever we have steady state, not just synchronous steady state, just steady state, the generator outputs can be expressed in this specific fashion, right? PG circle plus pi G times psi, a nominal value perturbed away by a fraction of a slack variable with that fraction represented as a participation factor. So indeed, one can always solve power flow for any steady state if these three constitutive terms are correctly identified and they take different values depending on when you're trying to solve power flow. The most common thing to do, however, is to solve the power flow in synchronous steady state. That's what we are doing, uh, you know, even without, you know, explicitly stating it as such. And in this specific regime, we recover the interpretation of the constitutive elements of the distributed slack bus uh, that we uh, discussed from before. In other words, the nominal value, the PG circle, is the optimizer from dispatch. Uh, the participation factor, the pi G, is in fact the AGC participation factor for that generator. And the slack variable, the psi, is area specific. So in fact, there's many different slack variables and it captures the net load imbalance for the specific area that the generator belongs to. This is indeed the right way to solve the power balance equations in synchronous steady state across balancing areas. So in the paper, we examine uh, several extensions that cover some edge cases and it covers some approximations. For instance, what, what if you know, only a subset of generators participate in AGC, as might very well be the case? Uh, well, the way to resolve this in the power balance equations is to just set the participation factors for the remainder uh, to zero. Uh, what happens if you only have primary control, right? No AGC, the dispatch uh, schedule optimizers are implemented directly. Uh, in this case, you get the so-called governor power flow. The participation factors are uh, based on the governor droop slopes from the generators. Uh, and the slack variable is system-wide. It doesn't decompose into uh, being area-specific quantities. And you can also set up a DC power flow uh, you know, counterpart to, to, these, uh, to these equations. It's very similar in form as the conventional setup. Uh, and you can get some additional insights and additional information. It yields, for instance, the net load imbalance uh, as part of the solution itself. So I'm gonna close out this section of the talk uh, with a set of simulation results. Uh, the simulation study is aptly performed for the New England uh, IEEE 39 bus 10 generator system. And we artificially separate this into two control areas. Uh, area one collects three generators and area two collects uh, the other seven. Uh, I'm going to establish ground truth here with a very detailed DAE simulation uh, implemented in PSAT. Uh, 
Uh, there's a detailed generator model. Uh, lines that are modeled are, are, are lossy. So it, it goes beyond the, uh, the simple model that we leverage for analysis and to prove the point that we did. And uh, furthermore, we also actually stitch in AGC, we feed in dispatch schedules externally to model all the layers that are pertinent uh, to grid operations in the context of, of power flow. So we try to capture as much complexity as possible in setting up this ground truth uh, simulation. And what we do uh, is we compare voltage magnitudes and phase angles that are obtained from the time domain simulations in steady state uh, to power flow solutions that are obtained from the distributed slack uh, formulation. So that's you know, solved in a, uh, in, in a single shot for both control areas. Uh, as well as power flow solutions that can be obtained from all possible single slack formulations, right? So in this case, if you think about it, there are 21 such options that will arise from pairwise choices of slack generators in the two areas. So I'll show you a few results. Uh, we'll utilize box and whisker plots to visualize the errors of slack bus and distributed slack bus power flow solutions. And these errors, are, as I said, are computed with respect, with respect to the ground truth uh, simulation results. Uh, data is collected from the simulations in steady state following uh, an approximately 10% change in the loads. Uh, the boxes contain data points between first and third quartiles. The whisker ends indicate minimum and maximum values. Uh, and the dash in the middle of the box is the median. Uh, I'll also point to the fact that you have two sets uh, of, of data that are plotted here. Uh, case zero is the results from the error of the distributed slack as compared to the time domain simulation. Uh, and cases one through 21, all right? So there's three times seven, as we talked about before, are the ones that capture all possible uh, single slack bus choices to solve the power flow equations. Uh, I'll also point out the fact that the axes, the Y axes are different. Uh, so we have a different axis for the distributed slack and a different axis for single slack power flow solutions. And you'll immediately see that I'm getting to uh, how one is much more accurate as compared to the other. So uh, this was actually the voltage phase angle error. You can see that we have uh, at least two orders of magnitude improvement in uh, accuracy as compared to any possible choice of single slack bus that you might have used in order to solve power flow uh, in, in steady state. Uh, and then the story repeats. For instance, if you look at the line flow error, again, we see tremendous improvement in computational, uh, sorry, in, uh, in, in solution accuracy uh, as compared to any possible choice of single slack bus that you could have done versus solving the problem with the distributed slack bus. For the voltage magnitudes, uh, there's, the, the story is slightly different. Uh, and, and in this case, the fact that a third of the voltages in the network are fixed by voltage regulators, since you know a third of the buses are really generator buses. This provides results that are not obviously favoring the distributed slack solution uh, across all possibilities. Uh, but again, the benefits are, are quite clear across the board. Uh, and then the story repeats. For instance, if you are looking at the DC power flow, right? So this was one of the approximations that we can do uh, in order to solve uh, this particular problem, uh, again, with the distributed slack. And we see in this case, maybe uh, not two orders of magnitude improvement in performance, but at least a order of magnitude improvement in uh, uh, in, in accuracy across the board, right? So no matter how you set up and solve the single slack bus power flow, it's really not representative of, of what's happening there. So the distributed slack solution always wins out. So while we took a close look at, uh, you know, a prototypical problem that is uh, quite foundational to power engineering, I want to emphasize uh, how we were able to piece these things together, right? And why that approach is critical to several challenges that we face today. Uh, in particular, it was our realization and appreciation that the grid does not just mean the physical layer interfaces, but also encapsulates the control and optimization algorithms uh, that regulate the physical layer interfaces that helped us piece together dis the distributed slack formulation for the power flow. Uh, and I'll claim that such uh, integrative thinking and research at the intersection of physics, optimization, and control is central to addressing challenges in modeling, analysis, and synthesis uh, going forward. Uh, I'll provide two more instances of how such integrative thinking can help unlock secrets uh, of the grid today, uh, as well as outline some solutions for the grid of the future. So consider the following question, right? Uh, here, I'm showing you a, a much more simplified version, a single control area. And we'll just examine this question for the simple 
single control area uh, power network. Uh, and I'm going to pose uh, the, 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 the question of what are optimal choices of AGC participation factors, right? These are the alpha G terms that we have uh, in this uh, layer that's sandwiched between tertiary and, 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 and uh, uh, physical air dynamics. Uh, so there have been several passing and less than rigorous references that a selection of AGC participation factors based on cost criteria of generators, right? So such as the one that's shown in this equation uh, at the very bottom here is a so-called optimal choice. Uh, however, what that means, right? What it means to be optimal and what are precise conditions under which such statements can be made have never quite been formalized. Uh, we provide through this theorem uh, which I won't go through in detail. I'll invite you to look at the paper for it. A very precise, necessary, and sufficient condition for when the conventional AGC system with these participation factors, right, picked out in this way, uh, in fact, steer and in a provable fashion steer system operation to a KKT point of the underlying economic dispatch problem. Uh, and in fact, we do this uh, in this uh, uh, instance for a dispatch problem with losses, line flow constraints, and box limits on generation. So it's a very strong statement. It's an if and only if condition. Uh, and such a statement I claim would have been quite impossible to make without our investigation into uh, and characterization of the generator power outputs that we discussed uh, previously in the context of the distributed slack bus. And finally, we'll, we'll take a look to the future. Uh, we have all seen pictures that look something like this. Uh, future grids will indeed have many inverters instead of a few generators, and crucially, timescales pertaining to operations, pertaining to control and planning, they will all shrink. Uh, to facilitate renewable integration at large uh, and at scale, it will be quite critical to have inverter-based resources participate across the board in primary, secondary, and tertiary control. They'll have to move away from being price uh, takers to being price makers. Uh, but these may conceivably look very different. So what we mean by primary, secondary, and tertiary control uh, will, will indeed look very different from what we have come to be used to today. Uh, and in fact, the very notion of synchronous operation, the very notion of frequency itself, uh, I claim will have to be redefined. Uh, and it will no longer directly be linked uh, to the physical motion of machines as we take it for granted today. So consider one challenge, uh, the challenge of integrating so-called grid forming inverters. Uh, one possible architecture that we can speculate on is the one shown on the right. Uh, grid forming inverters, in fact, come in all shapes and sizes. There are large units, there are plants, there are aggregations uh, at, 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 the, at the distribution level. Uh, and so system and unit level control architectures will all have to be interoperable so that these grid forming inverters across uh, sizes will uh, interoperate as well as interoperate with generators. So the architecture that we have sketched here uh, on the right is speculative. It's one envisioned possibility. And it, in fact, mirrors the prevailing architecture on the left, uh, except we will definitely have to redefine balancing areas to make sure that they scale uh, to accommodate the exponential increase uh, in the number of resources. In fact, that's a very obvious uh, thing to think about in this setting, because inverters have much smaller ratings than generators. Uh, but more than that, the form and function of the optimization and control actions at secondary and tertiary layers and the services that are expected from inverters may end up being quite different. Uh, so if you consider a case where, let's say, we are just regulating uh, the operation of grid forming inverter-based resources based on frequency and tie line flows, much like it's done today, the power outputs of the GFM uh, uh, inverters will look something like this, okay? with terms that can again be teased out to be attributed to optimization, uh, to control either at the primary or secondary level, uh, and to system architecture. In other words, how the balancing areas are laid out. So I'll end by pointing out that we will continue to have to acknowledge uh, physics, optimization, <laughs> and control to really appreciate the operation of these new interfaces that we are going to uh, deploy on the grid uh, fast and furious, and much more so. Uh, since the boundaries between physics, optimization, and control are going to get uh, blurrier as, uh, as we transition to the grid uh, of the future. Uh, so with that, I will end, and I hope that leaves us with uh, plenty of time for uh, discussions and, and Q&A. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Sairaj. It's really uh, all over thought-provoking talk. 
<laughs> a lot of room for clarification, for questions, for probing into questions. So um, I think that uh, I would encourage people to put questions in your chat in the chat. And um, I don't know if there are any now, uh, but uh, maybe uh, we can we can look into that uh, in a minute. I just want to ask one clarification question first. Uh, when you showed your plots, you were talking about accuracy. How is the accuracy defined? So as I said, the ground truth is coming from this detailed DAE simulation, right? So that DAE, but DAE simulations also um, um, have, do you simulate dynamics of all the generators? Yes, yes. Okay. So we simulate all the dynamics onto steady state. We acknowledge, you know, much more complexity on the generator dynamics side, as well as the network is modeled to be lossy and, and so on. So there's- Right, but there is no slack, right? In other words- there is, Right, look, there isn't, right. You just yeah. look at phase angle differences and that's your ground truth. Okay, yeah. that was the clarification question. Um, I will start with, I've thought, as you know, about this for a long time and uh, Actually, we will follow up. Now I have a lot of things to follow up with you, but uh, probably the best definition I've had, I've heard, and my students know about is of the slack bus is doesn't have to be the largest generator or whatever, but we work in most of the models that you talked about. We work in the uh, ABC, uh, sorry, in BQ reference frame. But when you want to go back, like in inverters, in these faster things uh, that we have now with um, with switching in time domain and at kilohertz switching, the question begs itself, what is time zero? And it used to be, there is yet another interpretation of the slack bus, which says that if I go, want to go from BQ and I want to interpret my ABC waveforms, right? Because it's a three-phase thing. I want to get something that is time zero relative to what I always measure everything else. And in inverter systems, that becomes an issue because of PLL, phase lock loop and so forth. So just want to uh, plant that seed for thinking and maybe we can follow up if people want to have some discussion. Please feel free to show, send emails to Sairaj and me. And, uh, but I think that there is something that we have to think about when we go from, as you said, in the future, we're going to go to probably even standalone grid forming things and so forth. So when you try to interpret things in a very fast time scale, you, you want to go back to ABC reference frame. And the question is, where is that we start time zero, right? right so right. this is just a thought that we can follow up on that. But I have a whole list of questions I would prefer people to ask questions. So then do we have some questions? So yeah, there are some questions uh, in the chat. Should we? Uh... You can unmute people so that they ask questions. I think that's more interactive if you know how. Uh, yeah, actually they can they can unmute themselves. Uh, uh, is... Okay, so whoever is asking the question, who was asking the question? I don't see my chat, sorry. Yeah, maybe I can get started. Hi, Professor Thople. It's so nice to see you after, I don't know, four years from IRC Bangalore to here. Um, and uh, one big comment and compliment, I would say, it's such a nice way to go through the entire uh, sequence of how the concept came about. And my personal favorite was the Maria slide <laughs> because she's my PI too. And I was just wondering, uh, like you left us with a very thought-provoking slide that with renewables coming into the grid, what is going to happen? You know, we have to take care of a lot of things. But from your expertise in this area, and there are many more experts in this panel today, I would just like to ask, we know that inertia is a big problem with the renewables coming into the grid. What are some of the other big challenges that we should really be, cons be considering right now and prepare ourselves for such a future grid? Oh, it's that's an excellent question, uh, Pallavi. It's good to see you as well. Uh, uh, and you know, I think um, you know there, there's a whole list of these things, especially in the context of inverters. Uh, maybe I'll I'll try to align it with uh, with what we talked about in this presentation. Maybe just from the perspective of how we set up models, how we analyze them, and how we infer the results from them, right? So without getting into uh, you know 
uh, let's say discussions on inertia faults and, and and so on how do we even begin to educate engineers uh for the next generation to appreciate that look the grid is not just the inverters it's not just the solar panels right there is a very complex hierarchy of of both optimization and controls at the back end uh and you cannot appreciate what's going to happen unless you appreciate that back end right so i think the challenge is is really one on education uh because a lot of these other uh you know effects and and and, and features and signatures will continue to evolve uh what's incumbent on us is to make sure that we are all aware uh, that it's 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 not just the physics, right? So there's there's a little bit that's happening behind the scenes, uh, and and the slack bus and the power flow uh, is is something that we all take for granted, uh, but clearly there's there's a lot to be learned if you if you just look under the rug. Um, now, in in I'll also point you to uh, lots of recent technical uh, reports uh, that have been published on the topic of grid farming inverters. Uh, in specific, that's the area that I'm most familiar with. There's a research roadmap by NREL, there's documents from Australia, from Great Britain, and so on. Uh, and they really do lay out uh, across time scales, you know, what are very specific challenges that are expected as inverters get deployed across scale uh, alongside synchronous generators. Okay, so thank you, um, uh, Pallavi. So the related question, Ryan L. Ho, hello. Uh, do you want to ask the question or we can just read. Uh, uh, Ryan is asking, how do you set the angle reference in a distributed manner? This is a nice mathematical question. Right. So uh, again, Ryan, great question. Uh, and it speaks to why we need to, um, you know, uh, disentangle the slack bus and the angle reference, right? So the angle reference is nothing special. It's in fact just, uh, you know, a way to resolve the fact that the angles always show up as angle differences in the power flow equation. So if you move the whole thing uh, by a specific value, the, you know, the, 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 the solutions will continue to satisfy the power balance equations. So there really is no need uh, to do anything in a distributed fashion to set an angle reference. You can pick out any bus to specify the angle reference. Uh, so so it, it, it's an important question though, because it again points to how these have always been uh, you know, uh, combined uh, in a manner that's not actually representative in, in, in practice. Uh, but the short answer to your question is you can pick any bus to specify the angle reference. It's not related to operations or control. I think that again, the, the devil is in the detail as usual. So when we model our components, think about more general components other than generators, you basically use um, swing equations which are in terms of mechanical power rather than torque. So you assume that grid frequency is 60 hertz and so forth. We make a lot of assumptions in our DQ models. So my question and a question for everybody that I would like to follow up in as you go into these faster time horizons is uh, do, you, do you actually need to um, do you actually need to model the the time domain rather than I I I have reached the point myself and I don't know how people feel about this that um, DQ and we already have some struggles with microgrids that we simulate at Lincoln Lab. If you design the controller in DQ reference frame for, for the inverter and then you want to implement it using PWM, for example, Palavi knows you do the switching at kilohertz level. What time, what is the relevant time scale that is going to tell you something about quality of service, which is not 60 hertz, is not DQ. Uh, what is the relevant model that is actually going to be good enough not to trigger the protection and so forth. So I think this distributed slack bus goes back to, um, in some sense, to history when we say that DQ angles that it only matters to have the phase angle difference between uh, between uh, uh, nodes rather than uh, or the machines or components rather than individual ones. I uh, it really is important to revisit those questions and we go to the to much faster time scales where you know the dynamics are very different interaction dynamics we need to capture and at MIT as you may know now Sarah they are working a lot on that. Um, if you try to put two components together, they're going to align themselves through interactions. 
what is the best way to capture that interaction at what time scale and so forth. So I think uh, I fully agree with the idea of we need to model connected physics and so forth, but this is just to reinforce that, that as we get these newer systems, we really have to think about what models are telling us what. Okay. So, so, so Maria, I'll just say one thing to that. Sorry, Dan, but I'll, uh, I'll just say one thing to that. And you're absolutely on the money, right? So even that picture I showed with that frequency, you know, with, uh, with, with the load change, getting your governor response, getting you back. I mean, it's, that's not going to be the case, right? Going forward, right? So, I mean, we will constantly be away from, from synchronous operation, depending on how we build up the grid of the future, right? So it's, it's time scales. I think, are everything. Uh, and whenever we solve problems such as the power flow, or even let's say, you know, we talk a lot about solving dispatch problems or OPF, right? No matter what you're doing, I, I completely agree with you that, that time scales and uh, and, and, and keeping that in mind is super, super important. Otherwise we get these solutions and they have no interpretation or they don't really match uh, what's what's actually happening in, in, in practice and in reality. All right, okay, thank you. So let's see, uh, Masood Barati, I think I can see you. Can you ask your question? I think it's related to this frequency thing. Sure, uh, so my question is that, uh, that during the, the AGC response, the frequency of the system is not a constant value, it's changing and reaching to the 60 hertz. So, but uh, when I actually see your uh, the proposed model, so you have combined the power flow as an SCD state equation with the um, uh, participation factor and also the AGC uh, uh, relevant to the AGC factor. How do you justify your answer? You have uh, combined the two different time domain together. Uh, mm -hmm. So as a so um, this question is a follow-up question of the Maria discussions, I think. Right, right, the same, yeah. Right, so Masood, uh, again, excellent question. So what we do is, uh, and the devil is in the details, but in the paper, we highlight how we combine them. And, and really the way to do it is to just set the appropriate uh, derivatives for the uh, dynamics that you anticipate to be in steady state to zero. Right, so you are. We are not examining the dynamic operation of AGC or the dynamic operation of generators. Rather, we are examining their steady state operation uh, over a specific uh, time scale of interest to then align that uh, with the power balance equations. Uh, so I'll, I'll I'll point you to the paper, but but it's uh, it's it's through a steady state examination of those of those specific dynamics. So just to add uh, to plug uh, uh, a good re reading reference, Shishing Liu did the PhD thesis at CMU. Uh, who knows, ten years ago already. He's one of the leaders in Southern Grid China now. They're already implementing some of these things. His big thing in the thesis was that if you have intermittent uh, resource, you never actually can justify the separation between secondary, quasi-static. Oh, absolutely. And okay. Now that begins to really throw the wrench into everything. And uh, so I can't even do economic dispatch by itself. Economic dispatch is evolving and it's affected by something that's time varying and so forth. So, um, so again, uh, very careful, but uh, his modeling is very interesting because it's basically saying that you should look at stabilization and regulation, let's say, the same as one process. And we can talk about more if people are interested. But uh, Xixing Liu, if you look for the thesis from CMU, uh, it's very interesting remodeling, I think. Yeah, that's okay, again. So, yeah. E excellent point, Maria. I, I completely agree. Like you, okay, you know, these... so I think we have a lot of work to do for younger people, but I'll try to do as much as I can also. So uh, Rupamati Jadivada is also from uh, MIT with Palavi. Rupa, are you going to ask your question? Uh, sure. Uh, firstly, thank you very much for this uh, very nice presentation, Professor. So my question is with regards to the comparison plots that you had shown. And I was just wondering uh, if PSAT simulations would actually represent the physical grid. And also, secondly, uh, in the PSAT simulations, I would expect that since you're simulating a, a differential algebraic equations, uh, it probably also depends on the primary control and uh, 
the primary control set points have to be given by the power flow equations and it varies depending on how you set the slab bus and the corresponding reference points. So I'm just not sure uh, if the comparison is uh, going to be apples to apples comparison. So uh, I, again, the PSAT simulation is not performed uh, with any, uh, uh, you know, uh, it, it does not require a slack pass, right? So your algebraic peak solving the power balance equations uh, and everything else is modeled uh, with, with, with the dynamics. So uh, as I think your question points to how the set points are coming in. So we had to do a little bit more engineering. So it wasn't just a PSAT. So uh, we had to stitch in uh, a MATLAB routine to do the AGC dynamics, which for instance, PSAT, I don't believe uh, does that uh, in-house. Uh, so it was a combination of things to get the model to behave uh, as close to represent a, uh, to, to, to practice as, as possible. Uh, and it did not invoke a, a specific Slack bus. So it was again, trying to represent uh, or, or capture reality to the extent possible. Thank you. I think we have a question from Deepak Ramasabramanian from EPRI. I can't see the question, but Deepak, you want to ask? Yep, definitely, Maria. So, so, so Sairaj, uh, question to you. <laughs> um, relating to this aspect of, uh, and actually before I ask the question, I think uh, reaffirm Bangalore connection here. I saw that there was one somebody else from Bangalore. I'm also from Bangalore. Sairaj has connections to Bangalore. Let's reaffirm Bangalore connection here first. Uh, but, but with that, uh, also linking towards some of the stuff that Maria spoke about on time scales and the what is time zero and all of that. One of the things that keeps coming up is uh, when you look at something like a dynamic simulation or a stability-based simulation, you assume a certain snapshot of the system at that point in time. And we, we all know that the system is always varying and, and the system is, is never going to be in constant steady state because of uh, so many things that are changing around the system. But now if we go with more inverter-based resources and we assume a certain time zero, first thing is, are we assuming that in the next 60 seconds or in the next 30 seconds when we want to evaluate what happens after a disturbance, that the intermittency and uncertainty is associated with the sources, will they play such a crucial role that is, let's say you have a solar farm and you assume that the cloud cover will be so fast that it will come in within 30 seconds to change the initial condition at which you take in your dynamic simulation, which, so that leads to the time is equal to zero and time scales aspect. Yeah. But, but the other aspect is you now in all of this slack bus and EGC and economic dispatch formulation that is usually done over a larger time scale, right? You do 24 hour planning, you do mm -hmm. hourly planning, where that intermittency really comes into a, a greater picture. So in that circumstance, then how much more of probabilistic kind of studies will need to be carried out? Uh, and can we still go with the assumption that you do your probabilistic kind of analysis on the economic dispatch and maybe AGC time scale? but you still go with the uh, notion that once a disturbance happens, whatever is the snapshot of the system at that point in time, once a disturbance happens in the next 10 seconds after the disturbance, your initial conditions are not going to change and you just have to track the dynamic behavior of the system in those 10 seconds, which means you don't have to worry about any other variation that comes in due to a lot of these resources. Uh, yeah, I, I, okay. So th there's a few things, a uh, few things there, right? Uh, and I, I, I think, and, and let me say that. Granted, Saraj, I went all over the place with that question. <laughs> no, I, I, I'll, I'll take it more as a comment, right? Uh, which will, uh, which yeah, will exactly, yeah. <laughs> I think it's more of food for thought for us to just keep talking about this. It's, it's not really as a question, yeah. Yeah. So I, I'll, I'll just. Uh, maybe just echo the point that, you know, when we say things like, all right, I solved power flow, right? We just have to be careful what we mean by that. And I think that's cutting to the heart of, of what you're saying. And uh, 
it again speaks to how we need to better educate and, and how we need to better convey that there are lots of things going on behind the scenes. And, uh, you know, a simple thing like solving power flow uh, is the, the, the way we choose to introduce the topic to, let's say, undergraduate students. But, uh, you know, when I teach a power systems class, they're all there because they're interested in renewable energy, right, as your comment kind of suggests. And they are interested in what happens as there's cloud cover, there's wind, and, and all of these other things. And we don't really do a good job of conveying all of those aspects, at least not at the undergraduate level. Uh, so yes, I think we'll have to revisit some of these and, and be mindful of uh, what we mean when we say specific things. Uh, and I'll, I'll kind of leave it at that. So since there are no more questions, I want to bring up one more historic thing, which when I was your age, guys, I think that it was a huge issue. The AP people, American Electric Power people, were talking about inadvertent energy exchange. It was a big thing, right? In other words, you control your own control area, you control your own microgrid, but something still leaks somewhere else. And cumulatively over a certain time, you cannot control that. And there are different reasons for that. You can do that to singularity, to slack bus, internally power conservation law, and many things you don't know losses ahead of time. Uh, it really begs the question, of generalizing IE now to faster time scales. And just to put a plug for some of the things that we are doing now at MIT, our team is, you know, there is this notion of dynamic interaction variables that comes from the conservation of power and conservation of rate of change even of reactive power that unless you take that into consideration in your models, you are going to have all these leakages, you know, between different areas. So just for uh, people, you know, since you covered a lot of history, the notion, the old notion of IE was very important. And the question on the table is, what is the generalization of that now to faster time scales, like in the microgrids, and what are the practical implications? Um, so uh, you mentioned Fred Schweppe working on this. He was actually at AEP when he started this work, you know, because he was doing state estimation. So the history is very interesting and rich, but uh, thank you for bringing up some of that. I think that we almost are out of time, two more minutes. I don't see any more questions, any quick comments. Uh, maybe Syraj, you want to do some closing and we want to thank you. Uh, yeah, absolutely, Maria. I Again, uh, this was maybe before everyone else showed up. I really wish we could do events of this sort in, in, in person. Uh, and I, it does take a lot to organize seminar series of this, uh, this type. Uh, and I think over the past couple of years, uh, anyone who's organized things of this sort, I give them a lot of credit for pulling the community together, right? We've been isolated, we've been siloed. Uh, so a big shout out and a big thanks to both you and Dan for, for pulling this group together. Uh, and I look forward to being uh, involved in, in the future uh, talks. That, that, Thank uh, you. Uh, and for people who are on the call, please look for it. We are going to announce very soon the March workshop, which is going to be, I'm told, hybrid. For MIT, will be in person and people from outside will connect, but it will be at the national level. And it is, again, I think we need to rebuild the community. You know, there are a lot of new questions. Syraj came loud and clear from, you know, one zooming in into at least the question of Slack bus how we have to rethink a lot of things. So very much appreciated everybody's time and there will be another talk next Wednesday.